We're taking our question tonight from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We've been studying the subject of this prosperity gospel, and we're really, we've talked about the health side of the health and wealth gospel. Now we're talking about the wealth side of it, and, and we've, we've narrowed down to this question. Is there even anywhere in the Bible that promises that God is going to give you money in exchange for you giving money to the church? And um, for most of those passages, we've really just shown the answer is definitely no. Uh, not in that passage doesn't say that, or this one or that one. We've, we've gone through several. Now we've come to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, where some is really a, a banner passage for televangelists. Um, they'll say things like, we want you to sow a seed into our ministry, and God will multiply the seed that you've sown and give back to you more than what you gave to our ministry. Is that even a biblical concept? Is that what this passage is talking about? We, we talked a little bit last week about how the idea of sowing and reaping is something used not as often as you might think in the Bible, but a few times throughout the scriptures. It's always referring to the consequences of an action or the result. When you do this, it's going to result in that. Just like when you plant corn, you're going to grow corn. <laughs> when you plant this, you're going to grow that. Um, and so they're not the same things that you're getting back. It's just you planted a seed, you reaped the fruit. You plant an apple seed, you grow an apple tree and get apples in, in return. So the idea is that sowing and reaping gives you this concept of consequences, positive consequences, negative consequences. You do this and there's a reaction. Every action has a reaction, right? If we want to do scientific terms. Well, here's the phrase in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. It is verse... Uh, <laughs> I've uh, marked it up so much that I, I, now I need to find the verse here. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll start here in verse... Uh, oh, here it is, verse 6. Uh, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which showeth, soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Now, the question is, does this teach that if you give money, then you will reap money? Obviously, you're sowing something and reaping something, and there's something like a promise of God here that, and is connected with this collection that Paul is taking up. So it is connected with giving. The sowing here seems to be giving. Is the reaping getting money back? That's really the question. Is the reaping here getting money back? Well, to find the answer to that, um, <laughs> I'm not just going to give us the answer. We've got we've to find it. You've got to experience the, the journey of finding the, the answer. So let's do this. Let's zoom out and understand what Paul is talking about in this passage. And to do that, we're going to go back to the book of Acts. Now, in Acts chapter 24, verse 17, Paul is uh, giving a testimony, and he's talking about how when he came back to Jerusalem, remember that time he goes back to Jerusalem, if you are familiar with the book of Acts, he goes back to Jerusalem after he's, he's done uh, three of his missionary journeys, and this time he goes back to Jerusalem, and he gets arrested, um, and he's... Uh, sent to uh, sent to trial, then kept in prison, and then sent uh, to Rome eventually. Uh, well, during that time, he talks about coming back to Jerusalem and says that when he was coming back to Jerusalem, he was coming back to uh, do this. Look what it says in verse 17 of Acts 24. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings. He's talking about bringing offerings, of course, in the temple. He's trying to explain that he wasn't doing anything nefarious being in the temple. That was one of the things he was accused of. Um, he was going to do some insurrection or something in the temple. Um, but, uh, but he hadn't come for that. He was bringing offerings. And he also mentions alms. Alms is giving to the poor. And Paul said, what I did is I came to Jerusalem to bring money to the poor people in Jerusalem. Now, he wasn't just bringing it to every poor person. He was bringing it to the Christian poor people who were starving. They were going through a famine. And so this is what Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians 9. He's talking about before he goes back to Jerusalem. He's saying, I'm going back to Jerusalem, 
and I need to collect whatever money you want to send with me to bring to the people in Jerusalem. You see, they couldn't just um, go online and transfer money through, you know, from one bank account to another. You know, uh, that's, they couldn't just write a check. They, and, and Paul couldn't call them when he got to Corinth and say, hey, I'm here. I'm at such and such a place. Bring all your money here. No, he had to, when he got there, he had to wait all the way until the next Sunday uh, because that was the next day that they would all be meeting together. And then, if they didn't have their money, then they're going to have to wait a whole another week until the following Sunday when everyone's back together, because he'll just remind them. So he's sending a letter ahead to tell them that he's coming so he can collect the money that he's heading to Jerusalem with. Um, go with me, if you would, to uh, Romans chapter 15. He writes about this to the Romans very briefly. Um, in Romans 15, it's the same collection. Here he says this in verse... 25, as he's talking to the Romans, you remember if you've um, done any kind of study on the first chapter of Romans, that Paul hadn't been to Rome yet, but he's talking to them about his endeavor to get there and to be at Rome. And um, in Romans 15, verse 25, he says this, but now I go to Jerusalem saying, look, I want to come to Rome, but right now I'm not on my way there. I'm going the opposite direction. I'm going to Jerusalem uh, to minister unto the saints. He's in uh, Greece probably at the time, or maybe in what we would today call Turkey, uh, when he's writing to Rome. To Rome. He says, I'm going to Jerusalem right now to minister to the saints. Why? To bring minister, to minister to them. They're, they're dying. I mean, there's a famine there. So I'm going there to minister to them, for it hath pleased them of Macedonia, Macedonia being nor northern Greece, or the north, just north of Greece, um, and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are, for the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things. He says, he said, listen, the, uh, the saints in Greece, um, the saints in Macedonia, um, are debtors to the saints in Jerusalem. Why? Well, because that's where the missionary efforts began, going out into Gentile lands, right? This is where the apostles were. This was the first church. You know, you could read about the first couple of chapters of Acts, the, the day of Pentecost and all of that. And these people from Jerusalem spread around and brought the gospel as far as even to Rome. And he's saying, I'm bringing these funds back there because these people feel like they're debtors to the folks in Jerusalem. And now they hear that the people in Jerusalem are in trouble. And so they're sending funds to help them. Um, for if, verse 27, uh, I'll start at the beginning, it has pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. They've already received the spiritual blessings um, from, uh, from, the, from the saints in Jerusalem, and they're going to minister back in carnal things. Ways. Now, this is important. Let me read verse 28, and, we'll, and I'll tell you why it's important. When therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. Now, he will actually come to Rome after this, uh, but, not on, but not on his own accord. He's actually going to be taken there um, as a prisoner. We read about that in the book of Acts. So he says, I'm bringing this fruit for them. The, the idea is this money coming back is the result of the, peop the faithful saints in Jerusalem sending missionaries out. So here, it's not because they gave money that they're getting money back, but rather because they ministered to people in spiritual things when they were in hard times, people wanted to minister to them. That was just, the, there's fruit. There's, that's the idea of sowing, reaping, fruit, all of that. Here's what Paul, Paul talks to the Romans about. That, there's a third party, right? They're not sending money. They're not receiving the money. Paul is just talking about what he's doing, how he's taking this money over to the people in Jerusalem, and that it's natural. Now, what Paul is, the way Paul is wording this is very careful, and he's explaining this to the Romans, but we're probably not going to catch it. And the reason is we don't live in a patron society today. But in Paul's time, there was, there was a, it was a patron society. You would, um, if you were, let, let me just say, you, let's say you're a baker, okay? You're gonna, you're gonna, you make, the, you make these wonderful loaves of bread, all right? And uh, you 
um, need to buy the equipment to make the bread, but you can make the bread. And uh, let's say, I'm just going to use this because I, I, I read it in a book and it was a good example and I'm going to use their example. So this doesn't originate with me. Let's say Lydia, who is a seller of purple in, um, oh, I'm, I'm trying to think, I think it's in Thessalonica. Uh, Lydia, seller of purple, she was a patroness. Um, she would have had a whole house. The church actually met in her house, which means she was wealthy, right? Um, so she would have had a whole house. She's a seller of purple. That's a, that's a very expensive thing to sell. That was her business. Um, so she would probably be a patroness. And what would happen is she would find, she would say, you know, look, um, I'm going to give you the money that you need to buy the equipment you need to, to, for the bakery. Great, wonderful, all right. Um, that would be called a charis, a grace that she gave to the baker. Um, Lydia would have given a grace, a charis gift to the baker. Now the baker, this is just how their society works. The baker is now expected to bake for Lydia. So if Lydia needs, if she, in the middle of the night, she has guests that come and she wants to give them bread, she's gonna go knock on the baker's door and say, hey, I need you to make bread, like right now. Get up, make me some bread. And he has to do it, because she gave him a grace gift. And so um, she's the patroness, he's the recipient of the gift, and he now owes her his service in return. And that's how, that's how they did business back then. It was very, very common. You were now under that, you know, if you had a problem with the baker's guild or whatever, she would make sure that it all sorts out. So a lot like the you know, those mafia movies you watch, The Godfather or whatever? I don't know if you watch those or not, but <laughs> it's kind of, it's very similar to that. That was just the society they lived in, just how they did it. So when Paul talks about gifts, he'll use this word grace, but then he'll try to get around this idea to help people understand that you're not getting anything back as far as service from these people. So what he's telling the Romans here is, look, the people in Macedonia and Greece, and they're sending this money to the Jewish people, but they, but, it's, but they don't expect anything in return from the people in Jerusalem because really they owe it to them. I mean, the, the first gift was from the Jewish people by sending out uh, missionaries to them. So it really wasn't, it's not, they aren't owed anything back in return, is what Paul's saying to, to the Romans. Now this is important, and this helps us understand First and Second Corinthians. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians, where it's mentioned just in a few verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, the first letter that Paul writes to the Corinthians, he mentions this gift. But in the second letter, he's saying, listen, I'm coming very soon. You need to have the gift ready. So here's what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Now, concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall... That, that, by the way, it tells us that that's when they met, was on the first day of the week. They were not meeting on Saturday. Why? Because some of them were Jews, and on Saturday they are going to be in synagogue. So they met as a church on the first day of the week, because that's when Jesus rose from the dead. So he says, when you guys all get together on the first day of the week, lay up the, the, the funds, so that way it's all ready to go when I get there. Uh, we don't need to wait and have gatherings when I come. And when I come... Whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. Uh, see, at the time, Paul doesn't realize that he's going to end up bringing it because um, uh, his travel plans were a little different at the, at the time. And if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. See, he doesn't know if he's going to go back to Jerusalem yet when he writes this in 1 Corinthians 16. But now, when he's writing 2 Corinthians, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, because this is where the conversation begins. When he goes to 2 Corinthians, he's now about to come to Corinth, and he's writing ahead of time a couple of re for a couple of reasons, to follow up on his last letter on several issues, uh, to defend his apostleship, because after his last letter, some people in Corinth were saying, he's not really an apostle, we don't have to listen to him, and then also to get them ready for this gift that, they're going, that he's going to now pick up, and he's going to be the one to take it. So here's what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit, which is a strange way to say it, we want you to know, um, we do you to wit of the grace of God, there's that word, grace, charis, the charis gift, the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. 
Now, Corinth is in, is in Greece. It's in the southern, you know, what we would consider Greece today. It's in the southern portion of that. Um, Macedonia is in the north. So the churches in Macedonia, you can read about in Acts 16 and 17. It's Berea, it's Thessalonica, and Philippi. Okay, so Philippi, Thessalonica, you can actually read the letters to the Philippians and to the Thessalonians. Uh, there's no letter to the Bereans, sorry. Uh, but uh, the, those are the three churches we know about in Macedonia. Now, G, now Jesus, Paul is saying, I'm gonna, uh, I want you to know before I get there to Corinth that the people in Macedonia, which must be where Paul is at the moment, the people in Macedonia have really received grace from God in that they are able to give. You see that? Like, he's not saying they are giving a grace gift and should expect something back in return. No, they are graced by God with the privilege of being able to give. And they're actually giving back to God in response to all the grace he's given to them. God is the, is Jesus, uh, Jesus, I keep saying Jesus. Uh, Paul here, I, I'm I'm transporting myself to Luke where I'm talking about what Jesus says, right, um, on Sunday mornings. No, Paul here is talking, and he's setting up God as the, um, as the patron. God is the one who's given to you, and now you owe him back in return. And you aren't giving to the people in, in Jerusalem. You're giving to God, really. And you're giving not because he's going to give you something, but because he already has and so he says, we do you to it of the charis, the grace of God that was bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in great trial of affliction, by the way, go to Philippians and, and, and First and Second Thessalonians and read about all the times Paul talks about the trials and tribulations that these churches are going through. It was bad. I mean, these places, especially Thessalonica, where there was a, a legion of, uh, there, there was actually a station, like an outpost of Roman troops they were throwing people in prison in Thessalonica um, for being Christians. And even in all of that, even in their deep poverty, they still abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, and yea, beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift. Now, we already talked about this, so I won't emphasize it overly much. But Paul here is saying, they had to beg me to take it because I didn't want to take it because it was more than they could afford, and I knew they couldn't afford it. So Paul didn't have the idea that if you give more than you can afford, God's going to give you more back in return. Otherwise, he wouldn't have, they wouldn't have had to beg him to take it. He was saying, I don't want to take this because this is more than you guys can give. Now, Paul didn't, obviously didn't have the theology that said God's going to give them extra back because of the extra that they gave. No, he's just now marveling over their heart to, to give to the people in Jerusalem above what they're able to. So it's not wrong to give above your, what you're able to, but it's, it is wrong to give that thinking, now God's going to give me extra back because I gave more than what I was able to. No, that is not um, correct. So verse 5, And they did this uh, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord. He's like, man, we, they did even better than we thought. They gave themselves to the Lord they just were saying, man, if, if it's ours, it's God's. If it's God's, it's ours. You know, whatever. We're, we're, you know, we are the Lord's. And unto us by the will of God. Insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Paul is sending Titus ahead, apparently with the letter of Second Corinthians, to go and, and get them together and get them ready um, for uh, Paul to come and take the, um, and, and take the offering. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and in utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace. There's that word grace again also. Oh, we got time. Okay, good. Um, verse 8. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. He's like, here's why you should give. Just to prove that you mean it. Why? Well, he's going to explain in a moment that the Corinthians were apparently either the first church to come up with the idea to send money to the people in Jerusalem or were one of the first churches to come up with this idea. And it was the Corinthians' desire to send money to Jerusalem that had actually caused the people in Macedonia to say, we want to send money too, right? 
And so he says, now I'm coming, and you guys need to prove that you were sincere when you said that you, you wanted to send them some money. I, don't, I just gathered up from other churches saying, hey, people in Corinth wanted to take, wants to take money to the people in Jerusalem, and now I don't want to come and get nothing from you guys. I mean, that would be really awkward. Uh, verse 9, for you know the grace, there is again, there's the charis. He's like, you're going to, the grace is coming from God. You are, you're going to abound in this grace, this great opportunity that God has gifted you, the charis, the grace, to give. And so, but you know the grace, the charis of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Who's the one we owe? It's him. We owe him. And so this is a great privilege of giving back to him because he's already given to us. That's the idea of giving that Paul is uh, giving, especially to other believers in whom is the Spirit of God. Uh, and uh, that is the point. Okay, verse 10. And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you, who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. So a year ago, they were also like, yeah, we want to do this. Verse 11. Now, therefore, perform the doing of it. Who have begun before, that, that phrase implies that before the churches of Macedonia got in on it, the Corinthians were already in on it a year ago. And now he says, now, therefore, perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which you have. You've already said you wanted to do this. All right, now let's just do it, okay? For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. He says, listen, if you have a willing mind, just give what you're able to give. Don't give what you can't give. You don't have to try to give more than what you can give. I tried to keep the people in Macedonia from doing that. You don't have to, don't feel any pressure to give above what you're able. Just what you have if you uh, still have that willing mind. Verse 13, for I mean not, other, not that other men be eased and ye burdened. He says, listen, I don't want to take uh, money to Jerusalem and tell the people in Jerusalem how much you need now because you don't have enough, okay? That's not the point here. We're trying to help them out. We don't want to make it worse for you. Um, we're trying to make this work. Verse 14, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance, now that word, the word abundance is used in English here in both of these chapters a lot, but it's not translated from the same Greek word every time. This time it's from the Greek word perusima. Uh, I know I butchered that, but uh, it means extra. Your abundance, your extra amount may be a supply for their want, their lack of something. That their abundance also may be a supply for your want and there may be equity. Now that sounds a little strange. How are they, they don't have abundance. Yeah, they don't have abundance in money. They have abundance in need. And their abundance in need supplies for your lack of helping them. And now you get the opportunity to help them, and they get the opportunity to receive the help. And these are opportunities, see? They need something, and that is money. You need something, and that is opportunity to serve the Lord. And so you guys both get what you need. That's what Paul's saying. Uh, follow his, his uh, logic here. Uh, there may be equality. You both get what you need. Verse 15, as it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing left over, and he that gathered little had no lack. That's a quotation from Exodus 16 talking about the gathering up of manna, and they were only to gather what they needed for the day. They weren't to go gather extra because then it would spoil. They just gathered, if you had a big family, you gather what you need for a big family. If you had a little family, you gather what you need for a little family. And Paul is saying, listen, I don't want you to give more than what you can give. Keep what you need and give what you don't need to them to meet their needs. So everybody has what they need. Verse 16, But thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. For indeed he accepted the exhortation, but being more, more forward of his own accord, he went unto you. And we have sent, him with, uh, sent with him the brother whose praise in the, uh, the gospel throughout all the churches. And not that only, but who was also chosen of the churches to travel with us with this Grace, charis, which is administered by us to the glory of the same Lord and declaration for your ready, uh, of your ready mind. Avoiding this, that no man should blame us in the abundance which is ministered unto us so, by us. So nobody needs to, we have, we have good trusted men keeping track of this money. Nobody should be concerned about it getting lost, you know, uh, Judas kind of thing, you know, where he has the bag. 
um, I want you to know we have trusted men, Titus, and then he mentions another brother but doesn't give the name. Uh, it appears that he's mentioning another brother, and of course, Paul himself. So there's a group of trusted men uh, keeping an eye on the money. Verse 21, providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. And we have sent with them our brother, whom we have oftentimes proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligently upon the great confidence which I have in you. Whether therefore any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you, um, or our brethren um, concerning you, or our brethren be inquired of, they are the messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ. Wherefore, show ye to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. There's the context. Now let's read chapter 9. For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write. It's not necessary. You guys know this, but I'm going to write it anyway. Okay? Uh, Verse 2. For I know the forwardness of your mind. You guys already want to do this. So I don't really need to encourage you to do it. I'm just kind of just in case because I don't want to get there and you have nothing. Um, I just want to send this. For which I boast of you to them of Macedonia and of Achaia. I was telling people in Macedonia and Achaia about how much you desire to send money to the people in Jerusalem. And I was boasting, saying, look at, the, look at their desire. That was wonderful. Uh, but Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal has provoked very many. Yet have I sent the brethren, lest your boast, our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf. As I said, you may be ready. I've been going around telling everyone how much you want to give to the people in Jerusalem. I don't want to come there, and, and you guys aren't ready, and like I leave with nothing. I mean, that would be really awkward. That's what he's about to say. Lest happily, if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, now notice this parentheses, that we say not ye should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. He says, you shouldn't be ashamed if you give nothing. But I will be ashamed if you give nothing because I told everyone you were going to give. But you shouldn't be. Now, if they had some sort of obligation to give this, then Paul would say, we should both be ashamed if you do give nothing, right? But he says, no, you shouldn't be ashamed. If you can't give, that's all right. But I'll tell you what, after all the boasting I've done, I'm going to be pretty ashamed if you don't give anything. So I'm I'm hoping that that's not the case. But that we say, not ye, is a very important phrase. It tells us a little bit about giving in the church. It was not under obligation. There was no such thing as a mandatory giving in the church. Um, That's not... That's not what we see in the scripture. Verse 5, Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up your bounty. Wherefore ye ye had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty. Now here, in this verse, both of those words, bounty, is eulogia, the the Greek word eulogia, which means a gift, a, a willing gift, something you give willingly. Right? It's not extra, that's what he used before, the word perusima. This is, um, this is eulogia, okay, which means a gift. So he's saying here, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your gift, your bounty, whereof ye had notice beforehand that the same might be ready as a matter of a willing gift, something you are willingly giving and not of covetousness, meaning You guys are not the patrons. You don't get anything in return. You are not giving because now they're going to owe you something. That's what he said to the Romans when he was talking about the Corinthians giving. He was saying, they really already owe it to them. And now he's talking to the Corinthians and he's saying, listen, don't give this because you think you're going to get something in return. Don't give this for covetousness. Give this willingly or don't give it at all. Verse 6, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He says, you shouldn't be giving for the purpose of getting, but he that sows, sowing is obviously giving money in this case, in this example, shall reap. You will get something back. So what is the thing, right? All right, we're finally there. I know we're late. Let's get to it. What is the thing that we reap in return that he's promising to them? It's not going to be something that's going to inspire covetousness. Is going to give them, they're going to get something else. Uh, Verse 7, every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, again, it is not mandatory, but as you purpose in your heart, so let him give, not grudgingly. Hey, look, if, if this is too, if you don't feel like you can do that, if you're going to be grudging about it, don't do it. Just don't give it. We'd rather you not give. 
uh, not grudgingly, or of necessity. If you feel like you have to give, like, like everyone else is given, and now you have to give, and you really just don't have the money, don't do it. We don't want it to be of necessity. This is a free will gift. That's what God desires of you. If it's not, don't worry. Don't, don't give it. For God loveth a cheerful giver. Now, he's in heaven, so I can, I can tease him now. He agrees with me now. But my former pastor used to, he used to, sometimes when the offering plate was coming up and, you know, they were, the ushers were, he said, you know, God loves a cheerful giver, but he'll take a grumpy one too. That's actually the opposite of what the verse is saying. It's funny, and actually I, I might have used it here once or twice since I've been here as a pastor, but that's the opposite of what that verse is saying. It's saying, no, 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 don't do that. If you feel like you are, you have some force laid on you to give, don't give at all. Just don't. God wants you to give cheerfully or not at all. And it's not like, go get cheerful. No, it's like, listen, if you can't afford it, that's okay. That's all right. God will give you the money to give when he wants you to give. Um, Verse 8, and God is able to make all money abound to you. No, God is able to make, what is he going to give back to you? Grace. Well, what is the grace, right? Grace could be anything, right? It could be any good thing from God could be grace. What is the grace? Well, it's good. He's going to make all grace abound toward you that ye always having all sufficiency in all things. He's just saying, look, God gives you everything, doesn't he? So, I mean, he's, all, he's going to keep giving you everything you already have. Um, may abound to, here's the one thing that he says you're going to have in exchange. Well, one of the, the first thing, there's a few of them. Every good work. Hey, you can do more good works by doing this. There's what you get in return. You get the opportunity to do a good thing. This is a good work. This pleases God. Is that not reward enough to know that your actions please God? That's a reward, knowing that your actions please God. That's a great um, fruit. That's what you reap for giving. You know you gave something that pleased God. You please God. There's a great reaping that you get from sowing the seed of giving to these poor people. Verse 9, as it is written, he that dispersed abroad hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Psalm 112 is actually talking about giving to the poor. That's what Psalm 112 is. That's a quotation from Psalm 112, verse 9, which says exactly that. The thing you get back in return for giving to the poor is righteousness. Is that not a reward to be doing righteous things? I mean, who are we to have the opportunity to do righteous stuff? I mean, us miserable sinners who should be burning in hell at this very moment. I mean, that's a wonderful privilege that we get to do right things. That's a wonderful result of giving is having righteousness on our account. Now, he that ministereth seed to the sower, hey, he gave you the money in the first place. He ministered the seed to the sower. Now, we're talking about God, right? Both minister bread for your food. Here's another thing you'll get in return. He's going to keep on giving you your daily bread like he always has been. Well, that's not anything special. That's not he already does that, yeah? That's right. That's why you're giving, because he already gives you everything that you need. He that already has given you the seed to sow, he's going to minister bread for your food. He's going to multiply the seed sown, meaning he's going to give you more things that you can also give, right? Not more things to keep, not make you wealthy, just he's going to give you more opportunities to give. He's going to multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of what? Righteousness. You have more righteousness to show for your life. You're going to say, my life was more pleasing to God. Well, that's wonderful. These are all wonderful things. They're not money. That's the whole point, right? God gives you lots of benefits for giving, but he doesn't give you money back. That's not what he promises. All right, let's, let's go just a little bit further. We'll close it up. Being enriched in everything unto all bountifulness. Okay, that's got to be including money, right? <laughs> no, which causeth through us, thanksgiving to God. He says, what you're doing is producing thanksgiving to God. Those people in Jerusalem are going to give thanks to God for what you're doing, which means God's getting thanks. And isn't that a wonderful fruit of giving, that God would get thanks? Look at the next verse. For the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. See, not only are you supplying what they need, but you're also causing them to thank God. Wow, what an easy way to minister and bring glory to God by just giving some money to someone who's in need who's going to then thank God for it. That's wonderful. Verse 13, now that doesn't happen if they're not a Christian, which is why this is specifically applicable to giving money to poor Christians. 
It doesn't mean you don't give money to other poor people. That's a separate issue. But this is talking about giving money to poor Christians. Verse 13, while by the experiment of this ministration, they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal dis- distribution unto them. Look, they gave out the gospel. You received it. And it's true that you received it because you're given back to them when they're in need. And they're going to be so glorifying God that the gospel did such an effect in your hearts and your liberal, liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. And by their prayers for you, here's another thing you get back. They're going to be praying for you, I tell you what. I mean, their prayers are going to be with you after this. I tell you that for sure. For the exceeding grace, there that word is again, the caress of God in you. So God is just giving through you. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. It's really God who gave the unspeakable gift. And we're just responding to his gift. So does 2 Corinthians chapter 9 tell us we'll get money back in response for giving money to God? No. As a matter of fact, it gives a lot of things we'll get back. And the one thing it doesn't mention is money. I mean, is it God's going to keep taking care of your daily bread. He's going to keep doing, you know. And Paul is just avoiding saying that they're going to receive anything physical or carnal in response. Because he's showing them they shouldn't expect anything physically and carnally in response to this gift. And if that's what they're thinking, they should just not give at all. But instead, they should give out of a heart that says, God has already given me the unspeakable gift, and he gives me my daily bread, and and he's given me whatever extra I have. And if I have extra, why would I not want to give to this? This is a great opportunity to serve God and bring glory to him by giving. That is leads us next week into the discussion of what does the Bible actually say about giving to the New Testament church? What does it say in the New Testament to churches about giving? What are the things we should give to, the the things that the New Testament church gave to? There's three categories of things that they gave to. Um, We're going to talk about, uh, of course, the subject of the tithe, because that's the one thing that people will say, no, no, if you give the tithe, God God will bless you, and if you don't give the tithe, God won't bless you. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about um, the areas uh, that the church um, supported, the things the church supported in the New Testament, talk about all those things. I'd love to have it done before our budget meeting, which is is not going to happen, okay? But we'll keep going in that direction. All right, uh, let's, uh, let's pray, and I'm sorry to keep you an extra 15 minutes, but I think it was worth it. We had a lot to cover, and it was good to put it all together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for the unspeakable gift of your Son. Lord, let us never forget that you don't owe us anything. You've already given us far more than we could possibly give back, and yet Every day, your mercies are new. Every day, you continually load us down with blessings. Every breath we take, I mean, it's just overwhelming the grace you've given us. And help us to be so filled with appreciation for your gifts, for your grace, that giving of all the things you've given to us to help others in need, especially those in the church. May it be something that is so natural to us because of our gratefulness to all that you've done. May we just live in this state of being overwhelmed at your unspeakable gift. Thank you for it. Thank you for our study tonight. We pray these things in Jesus' name.